This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a man interviewing a woman in the street about her use of transport. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Excuse me? Yes? I wonder if you could spare a few minutes to do a survey on transport. It won't take long. Uh, no, that's fine. Oh, lovely. The survey is on behalf of the local council. They'd like to know about what transport you use and any suggestions for improvement. Uh, can I start by asking you how you travel to town today? Sure. I came on the bus. Great. Now, can I get a few details about yourself? OK. What's your name? It's Louisa. Yes. Hardy. Can you spell that, please? Yes, it's H-A-R-D-I-E. Great, thanks. And can I have your address? It's 19 Whitestone Road. Oh, right. I know that area. It's Bradfield, isn't it? That's right. Uh, is the postcode GT7? It's actually GT8 to LC. Great. And could I ask what your job is? Are you a student? I've actually just finished my training. I'm a hairdresser. Oh, right. And one more question in this section. What is the reason for you coming into town today? Actually, it's not for shopping today, which would be my normal <sighs> reason, uh, but to see the dentist. Right. Thanks. Before you hear the rest of the interview, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, in this last section, I'd like you to give us some ideas about the facilities and arrangements in the city for getting to and from work. Mm -hmm. um, any suggestions you have for improvements? Well, something I've thought about for some time is that when I do walk mm. and I'm doing a later shift, I think the lighting should be better. Yes, good point. And, of course, I think it's a real shame they've been cutting down on the number of footpaths. They should have more of those. Mm. Then people would walk more. Yes, right. And I don't think there are enough trains. That's why I don't use them. You have to wait so long. Thanks. And finally, I'd like to ask your opinion on cycling. As you may know, there's a drive in the city to get more people to cycle to work. Right. But we realise that there are things which the council, but also employers, might do to help encourage workers to cycle to work. Yeah. Well, 
I have thought about it, and where I work, there are no safe places to leave your bikes. OK. And also, I'd have to cycle uphill, and on a hot day, I'd arrive at work pretty sweaty, so <sighs> I think I'd need a shower somewhere at work. <laughs> right. And I suppose the last thing is that I wouldn't be all that confident about cycling on such busy roads. Mm. I think I'd like to see you offering training for that. You know, I'd feel a lot better about starting if that was the case. Well, that's very helpful. Uh, thank you very much for your time. No problem. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear the public relations officer from the council reviewing events that were hosted by the town in the previous year. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Kingstown has been a busy town this year, with some high-profile and new events happening in and around the area. In January, we hosted the National Kayak Selections, and this competition attracted a number of well-known paddlers, not just from this country, but from Canada, Ireland, England and Australia. Following this event, we had the nation's top bowls players descend on the township, with the national championships taking place at the Kingstown Bowling Club, attracting well over 400 players. It was a resounding success, as you could see from the numbers thronging the bowling centre in Main Street. February was the month for the seriously social rafting competition, and this was the first time Kingstown had hosted an event of this nature. It attracted 96 paddlers from all walks of life who enjoyed a great day of fun on the river. After the success of last year's open half marathon event, this year, in March, we hosted a women's only duathlon in an attempt to get more women involved in sport. The starting point was at the Kingstown Pool but an extremely chilly evening saw a huge reduction in the numbers we were expecting. However, approximately 50 participants were not deterred from tackling the event, which for many was the first time, and these hardy contestants went into the first 2.5k run with great enthusiasm. The cycle leg was extremely challenging because it was into a headwind all the way, and the last 5k run was no easier. At this point, I must thank all the volunteers who took time out to help make this event successful, especially the road marshals who did an excellent job. We must also thank the Kingstown Creative Pursuits Society for hosting the wonderful Autumn Festival. The women involved put on a magnificent demonstration of traditional and present-day craft work, 
ranging from ancient weaving techniques to modern pottery designs and sculpture. These ladies are highly skilled, and they got a good turnout on the day, which, by the way, they are thinking of making a biannual event. So we might have a spring festival on its way. Winter brought with it the annual Kingstown Youth Tournament, which was a huge success, with the allocated team slots filling up fast. Teams consisted of approximately 15 youths, ranging in age from 8 to 18. The teams spent the day on the fields of Prince Park, playing a round-robin touch tournament system. The event, which drew large crowds of the public who cheered and gave lots of support and encouragement for the teams, showcased some outstanding youth talent. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Now, what's coming up for the school holidays? Well, the town council has several plans lined up to keep the kids busy. Let's get straight into it. Programme 1, which will take place around the Prince Park area, has a sports agenda and will have participants engaged in a variety of sporting activities such as tennis, athletics, football and swimming. Programme 2 is for the somewhat less active and more creative children. They will do most of their activities in and around the Lord Hall area. These will consist of cooking, craft, dance and hairstyling. You'd be surprised at the number of children who leap at the chance to learn to cook, not to mention the other activities. The hall will be positively buzzing, I can tell you. This is a great chance for your children to learn a new skill or brush up on one that they're already crazy about. Programme 3 is for the more adventurous children. Because of this, we do insist on a minimum age limit of 11 years old. The Duke Recreational Area has been set aside for this programme. Expect your youngsters to learn a lot about leadership and teamwork as they accomplish some of their missions. They'll engage in activities such as skateboarding, rafting, orienteering, mountain biking and trekking. Well, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear two environmental science students, called Rosie and Martin, discussing their presentation on an extinct animal called the woolly mammoth with their tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. So, Rosie and Martin, let's look at what you've got for your presentation on woolly mammoths. OK, we've got a short outline here. Thanks. Uh, so, it's about a research project in North America. Yes, but we thought we needed something general about woolly mammoths in our introduction to establish that they were related to our modern elephant and they lived thousands of years ago in the last ice age. Maybe we could show a video clip of a cartoon about mammoths, but that'd be a bit childish. Or we could have a diagram. It could be a timeline to show when they lived, with illustrations. Or we could just show a drawing of them walking in the ice. No, let's go with your last suggestion. Good. Then you're describing the discovery of the mammoth tooth on St. Paul's Island in Alaska and why it was significant. Yes, the tooth was found by a man called Russell Graham. He picked it up from under a rock in a cave. He knew it was special. For a start, it was in really good condition, as if it had been just extracted from the animal's jawbone. Anyway, they found it was 6,500 years old. So why was that significant? Well, the mammoth bones previously found on the North American mainland were much less recent than that, so this was really amazing. Then we're making an animated diagram to show the geography of the area in prehistoric times. So originally, St Paul's Island wasn't an island. It was connected to the mainland, and mammoths and other animals, like bears, were able to roam around the whole area. Then the climate warmed up and the sea level began to rise, and the island got cut off from the mainland. So those mammoths on the island couldn't escape. They had to stay on the island. And in fact, the species survived there for thousands of years after they'd become extinct on the mainland. So why do you think they died out on the mainland? No one's sure. Anyway, next we'll explain how Graham and his team identified the date when the mammoths became extinct on the island. They concluded that the extinction happened 5,600 years ago which is a very precise time for a prehistoric extinction. It's based on samples they took from mud at the bottom of a lake on the island. They analysed it to find out what had fallen in over time. Bits of plants, volcanic ash, and even DNA from the mammoths themselves. It's standard procedure, but it took nearly two years to do. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So why don't you quickly go through the main sections of your presentation and discuss what actions needed for each part? OK. So for the introduction, we're using a visual. So once we've prepared that, we're done. I'm not sure. I think we need to write down all the ideas we want to include here, not just rely on memory. How we begin the presentation is so important. Mm, you're right. The discovery of the mammoth tooth is probably the most dramatic part, but we don't have that much information, only what we got from the online article. 
I thought maybe we could get in touch with the researcher who led the team and ask him to tell us a bit more. Great idea! What about the section with the initial questions asked by the researchers? We've got a lot on that, but we need to make it interesting. We could ask the audience to suggest some questions about it and then see how many of them we can answer. I don't think it would take too long. Yes, that would add a bit of variety. Then the section on further research carried out on the island, analysing the mud in the lake. I wonder if we've actually got too much information here. Should we cut some? I don't think so, but it's all a bit muddled at present. Yes, maybe it would be better if it followed a chronological pattern. I think so. The findings and possible explanations section is just about ready, but we need to practice it so we're sure it won't overrun. I think it should be OK, but yes, let's make sure. Hmm. In the last section, relevance to the present day, you've got some good ideas, but this is where you need to move away from the ideas of others and give your own viewpoint. OK, we'll think about that. Now, shall we show you some of the... That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear a talk given by an ethics professor on cheating. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. First of all, I would like to thank you for enrolling in this optional ethics course. For some time now, I've been pushing to have it made compulsory for all first-year university students. And you'll soon see why. Today's topic is cheating. For as long as there have been tests, assignments and examinations, there has been cheating of some form or another. How do we define cheating? Well, quite simply, some say it's a violation of the regulations. But what is that set of laws? Who composed them? And are they reasonable? Interestingly, a survey of Year 7 to 12 students last year showed that over a third of them cheated by cell phone during a test. Some by texting answers, and a much smaller percentage by searching the internet. Over half, yes, over half of the survey's participants admitted to cheating of some kind. But, and this is the thing, many of the students didn't even acknowledge web-based cheating as cheating at all. Most thought that phone cheating or downloading a paper off the net was nothing other than a minor offence. So, what's the implication? If it's not a serious offence, is it acceptable? We live in a digital age where learning is all about sharing information. And, let's face it, students today have seen so many instances of music, videos, images and text copied online without rightful recognition given as to their origin that I'm not sure whether you even fully understand the concept of plagiarism. But we can't blame the digital age alone. 
I know that ours is a high-stakes education system. By that I mean there is a great deal to be won or lost by a good or bad grade. If we scrutinise the system, we may well affirm that cheating isn't really dishonest. It's merely a survival skill. For many teachers and students, it's the product that counts, not the process. By process, I mean the way it is produced. You see, when learning becomes nothing more than information sharing, knowledge or data aren't figured out and understood. They're just retrieved and passed on. How much is actually absorbed? When we discuss cheating, we must look at the educational environment as well as the morality, or lack of it. Researchers have found that environments conducive to cheating are those where the focus is wrong. Sometimes instructors have no meaningful relationship with their students, perhaps due to overcrowded classrooms and lecture halls or individual personalities. Secondly, students who cheat are most often the ones who think the task is pointless or the amount of work is overwhelming. If the classroom is a place where learning is genuinely engaging and the emphasis is on openly exploring ideas, there would be no necessity for cheating. A third, and very important point, is that grades and marks matter more to some students than what they're doing. And lastly, achievement is taken to mean outperforming others, and these competitive practices encourage cheating. Anyway, I fail to see the value in working alone and cramming information into short-term memory. Real collaboration and cooperation puts the focus on thinking rather than on memorising. I have to say that it's the actions of teachers, classroom organisation and cultural background that have as much to do with cheating as individual student behaviour. Of course, some students cheat by plagiarising or copying because they simply don't understand the material, nor do they have any confidence in their writing skills. But I think the majority of students end up plagiarising because they just don't know how to cite sources correctly or how to sum up others' ideas in their own words. These reasons have remained the same for centuries. It's really just that the digital age has made it easier. But remember, teachers use technology to spot plagiarism too, so it's also very much easier for them. First-year students should have to complete a compulsory writing skills course, where the rudiments of proper referencing and summarising are taught. I also think it's a big mistake if ethics is not a first-year requirement as well. In this university, I think it's only the computing department that insists all its students complete a paper in ethics. Learning and education is not just about cramming facts or increasing your knowledge base. It's about intellectual integrity and honesty and rising to meet higher ethical standards. Now, this may necessitate a change in pedagogy and educational philosophy, but most importantly, it will involve a challenge to engage students in discussion on morals and academic morality. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.